Several years ago, whenever I finally worked up enough courage to begin to share my faith and witness um, to people, I, I learned that the easiest way for me to do that was to, was to carry uh, tracks in my pocket. So I've almost always have a, um, a gospel tract in my pocket. This one is the Steps to Peace with God. This one is, uh, do you know for certain that you have eternal life? And so I, I, I always try to keep that in my pocket. Just never know whenever uh, the opportunity is going to be there for you to pass that on to someone. I remember that um, uh, one of my favorite years ago, and I haven't seen any in a while, but was one that was put out with, uh, by, by Campus Crusade for Christ called the uh, Four Spiritual Laws Tract. Have any of you ever seen that? Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to look at Romans 8 today, just a, a few verses prior to what uh, uh, Brother uh, Bruce shared with us a while ago. In Romans chapter 8, look, if you will, at verse 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to his purpose, for those he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. And those he justified... He also glorified. Do you know that right in that path scripture is God's plan for your life? Yeah, that's his whole plan for your life and mine. I, the reason I, I like the four spiritual laws of uh, their, their track, I don't know what you're going to have to do to get me going here. There you go. It's still not working. So you may have to change it for me. Four spiritual laws. Y'all remember seeing this track? Next slide. The reason I liked it is because if you look at number one, God loves you, has a wonderful plan for your life. You believe that? Say amen. You really believe that? He has a plan for your life. I, the only thing that I, for some reason, and maybe this comes from all of my, my work experience, being a pipe fitter well, reading a lot of um, blueprints and plants, I, I just kind of like to call it God's design. I, I don't know why plan just seems to be an afterthought to me, but anyway. He doesn't have a plan for your life. Look at number two, that man is sinful and And experience God's love, and again, plan for his life. Then law three, Jesus Christ is God's only provision for man's sin. And through him, you can know and experience God's love and plan for your life. And then, of course, law number four, we must individually receive Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And then we can know and experience. And God's love and plan for our life. I love C.S. Lewis. I love reading him. C.S. Lewis says every morning we make a choice between whether we're going to follow God's plan or follow our own plan. He says this, the moment you wake up each morning, all of your wishes and plans for the day rush at you like wild animals. And the first job each day consists of shoving it all back in instead of listening to that other voice, taking that other point of view, letting that other larger, stronger life come flowing in. I love that. Do, do you understand what he's saying? He's just simply saying whatever your plans are, 
lay them aside. Often, my uh, prayer early in the morning is, God, help me and help me know what you have laid before me and help me accomplish that and only that which you have put before me. So, before we talk about what this verse 8, 28 means, I, I want to talk about a few things that it doesn't mean. What, what, what are some things that it doesn't mean? First of all, the things have a way of working out. Have you ever heard that? Oh, don't worry about it. Things kind of have a way of working out. It's all going to be okay. Well, you might get by with saying that here in America, but try telling that to the people who live in the trash yards of Honduras. Those of you who have been on mission trip with us in Honduras know what a poor, pitiful sight that is. Right, Brother Mitchell? Pitiful. And so try telling that to the family who lives in the trash yards of Honduras. When they're digging through the trash with dogs and even vultures. Next slide. Even vultures. Try telling them that, oh, it's all going to work out. It's all going to be okay. Next one, Maggie. You see, there, there, there are buzzards, there are dogs, wild donkeys, human, human beings, all foraging through other people's garbage, trying to get something to eat, to put something uh, as much as rags as it might be on their bodies to cover their bodies. Try telling these people that it's all going to work out in the end. And I would imagine that what they would say to you is some of the things that probably you've said or even heard said. Oh, really? Tell me how this thing is going to work out. Tell me how things are going to get better. My ancestors have done this for years and years and years. And here I am digging through garbage and rubbish of the world, the refuse of the world, just to make it. Try telling them it's going to be okay. Another thing that it does not mean is that it is not a generic optimism for those living according to the flesh. I understand what we're trying to do. We're trying to comfort people who are going through a hard time. But oftentimes, or many times, the person going through a difficult time is not a believer. So, so how can we give them a promise which was given to God's people and God's people alone? Notice what he says. He says, all things work together for the good of those who... Those who are living according to the flesh do not necessarily love God. Look at verse 12 in Romans 8. Notice what he says. So then, brothers, we are not obligated to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you are going to what? Die. So things are not going to get better. And then the third thing I would say that this verse doesn't mean is that random, it doesn't mean that random calamity and disease will never hit me. That is the message of the health and wealth, prosperity, God bless you bunch. Because trials do come to God's people. Amen? Troubles do come to God's people. Random calamity and disease comes to everyone no one is exempt, whether you're born again or not. Look at verse 35. He says, Paul says, under the inspiration of verse 35, he says, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Can affliction or anguish or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. Listen, if none of those things could come against the believer, then Paul wouldn't have had any need to mention it, right? That's right. So no one is exempt. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Here, here's the man who wrote those very words. Here's the man who, under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, all things work together for good of those who love the Lord and are called according purpose. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look at verse 24. 
Five times I received 39 lashes from the Jews. Three times I was beaten with rods by the Romans. Once I was stoned by my enemies. Three times I was I have spent a night and a day in an open sea on frequent journeys. I faced dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my own people, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in cities, dangers in the open country, dangers on the sea, and dangers among false prophets, labor and hardships, sleepless nights, hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and lacking clothing, not to mention other things. There is the daily pressure on me. My care for all the churches. Does that sound like a health and wealth, God bless you, prosperity uh, message? Quite the opposite, wouldn't you say? Amen? So, random calamity and disease, we're not exempt from that. And the fourth thing I would say that this verse doesn't say is that no evil act or another person will affect me. Hasn't Paul just those things? All you Trekkies out there. We have any Trekkies other than Jameson? <laughs> oh, we got an... Oh, oh, oh no! We, there's, uh, all the Trekkies! Well, you remember... I don't know how I remembered this. I, I probably visited maybe Jameson one day and he made me sit and watch Star Trek, I guess. I don't know. had this shield of force that they could put around their, what, what did they call their, their, the Enterprise. They, they had this shield of force they could put around the Enterprise and no weapons could, you remember that? Yeah. Huh? You see, for, oh, is that where we get, may the force be with you. Well, forget it. I ain't coming to watch that in with you. <laughs> but you see, that's what we want, isn't it? And that's what we think when we read this verse. That God's just going to put up a, a force field around us and that nothing can touch us. But if you will, look, at, look, look again at verse 39. Do you, do you see that Paul is just simply quoting from Psalm 41? Excuse me, verse 36. Because of you we are being put to death all the day long and are counted as sheep without to be uh, slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that even death or life or angels or rulers, none of these things become, uh, come or things become hostile powers, height or death or any of the created things will have the power to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And aren't you glad? So, obviously then, verse 28 is not saying any of these things. It's not saying that things have a way of working out. It's not saying that this is not a, a generic optimism for those that are living for the world, living according to the flesh. It's not saying that random calamity and disease will never come into your life. It is not saying that no evil act or another person will affect me because you, you know that happens to even born-again believers. And so if it's not saying all of these things, what exactly is Romans 8, verse 28 saying? Let's look at it again. We know that all things work together for the good. Well, first of all, notice that he says all things. He doesn't say some things. He doesn't even say that possibly some things, but not all things. He doesn't say maybe. He doesn't say we hope. He says with, with, without any of these other uh, adjectives or prepositions uh, or adverbs, he says, he says all things work together. For the good. Now, what does all mean? It means all. Wow, man, that, that was really profound, <laughs> wasn't it? All means all things. All things work together for good 
for the good. Doesn't say that all things that happen are good. Doesn't. It doesn't say that all things are good or all things that happen are good. Doesn't say it says all things work together for the good of who? Those who love the Lord. Those who love God. You see, he's working all things, whether they are good or bad, doesn't matter, or anything in between. He is working all of those for your good and his purpose. Think about the Apostle Paul and all that he went through. We just read it in 2 Corinthians 11. And here we find him now as these words chained to a Roman guard in prison and here's a man who could say under the inspiration of Holy Spirit that yes he says I'm I'm chained to guards but all things work together for the good of those who love God who are called according to his purpose think of Joseph in the Old Testament Joseph who was hated by his brothers sold into slavery falsely accused by Potiphar saying that he tried to sexually molest her. Potiphar, not hearing the truth or not listening to the truth, had him cast into prison. And while he was there, he was, he was really not treated fairly by those that he had helped uh, liberate from, or at least one of them from prison, by interpreting dreams. Later on, he gets out of prison and he is elevated from prisoner to prime minister of Egypt. All think why? Why? Well, because there was a there was a famine, and God was preserving His people, preserving Israel. He was making he he was making he was taking care of that remnant of His people, those that love God, and so He made him the prime minister of Egypt so that He could preserve the nation of Israel. All the things that Joseph went through, all of them were not good. But God worked them for good. He worked it together for good. Secondly, God's allowance has his purpose. Now, it took me a long time to understand that. It took me a long time to understand that. that can, someone say, well, couldn't God prevented bad things from coming into your life? Yes. He could have, but he didn't. And I don't always have the answer except to say that God has a greater purpose for that in your life. It, 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 he has a greater purpose than what you and I can understand at the time. God is going to work all things for good to those who love him because he has a purpose. Notice what he says. He works all things together for the good of those who love God, those who are called according to to his purpose. So first of all, he chose us. That's what he says in verse 28. He chose you, Barbie. Amen. He chose you, Chris. He chose you, Glory. He chose you, PJ. He chose you, J. He chose every born-again believer. He chose you, but watch this. He chose you from before the foundation of the world. I don't know about you, but I can't get that through my head. How did God know every one of us and choose us before he created anything? Before he created planets and stars and any part of the universe? The Bible said, look, look at Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. For he chose us in him. Why? He is eternal present. He is past uh, eternal past he is eternal present he is in eternal future right and he chose us in him before in before the foundation before he created anything the foundation of the world what he chose us to be holy and blameless in his sight so let me ask you how many of you are holy and blameless here today anybody well then i guess you're all lost people I'm just, I'm just reading what the Scripture says. He chose you before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. You know how He's going to do that? He's doing that through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. He is looking through the cross, through the blood of Christ, seeing 
saying you drew that blood before the creation of anything. He sees you covered by the blood of Jesus, forgiven and holy in Christ Jesus, blameless in Christ Jesus. If that don't make you shout hallelujah, your wood's all wet. Notice what he says. He predestined us to be adopted through Jesus Christ for himself according to his favor and will. I don't know about you, but I find great comfort in that. Amen. I am safe and I am secure. He chose me before the foundation of the world. He chose me. I him. If he'd left it up to me, I wouldn't have chose him. But he didn't leave it up to me. He chose me you're born again he chose you but not only that he changes us notice what he says in verse 29 he says for those who he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son now listen there are those out there who say that this predestination thing is that he said to some uh six uh, number six you're, you're in a fix number seven you're going to heaven Number eight, well, you're just too late. Number nine, oh, you're fine. But that's not what he meant by being predestined. He didn't, he didn't say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this one to heaven, but I'm going to take that one to hell, and I don't know about this one here yet. I'll, I'll decide about that one later. That's not what this predestination means here. What's he saying? He said, for those he foreknew, he also predestined for what? To be conformed to the image of his son. I want you to notice something here. When you see that phrase, conformed to the image of his son, I used to know the Greek word. You may know, Brother Jameson. It is, a, it is the Greek word that we get our English word icon. Now, you all know what an icon is, right? That's that little picture of that thing on your laptop or on your computer. And, uh, and when you click on that, it opens that up, whatever that is, right? That's an icon. So here's what he's saying. He is saying that he conformed us, or he conformed us to the image of his son. So it's like he puts, it's like he puts the image of his son on our laptop. And whenever he gets on his big computer screen or his big laptop and he clicks on the icon of his son and it opens, he sees you and me. Some of y'all are looking at me like, so what? Well, that's the best I can do with that. I'm sorry. I just tell you, I just think that's an awesome thing. That's an awesome thing. That he, is, he has predestined us to be conformed to look like Jesus. Now you say, well, nobody can be like Jesus. He doesn't expect us to imitate Jesus. Listen, how many people have you raised from the dead? I, I've never done that. I've never healed the paralytic. I've never healed the blind. I've never done any of those things like Jesus did. So I can't imitate him, but I can be like him. I can be like him in the power of Holy Spirit. Amen? You see, he began a process in me before the foundation of the world. And as long as I am alive and in this life, he is working that process. He is doing what Paul said in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, where he says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Listen, he's still working on me. And I, he's got a lot of work to do in my life. I, I, I have a lot of issues. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not like Christ yet in every area. I'm not there yet. He's still working on me. I say dumb things. I do dumb things. Uh, some of those dumb things that I say and they do, they hurt people and, and I, I don't mean to. It's just, I just, I'm stupid sometimes and I don't, you know, I don't think about what I'm saying. And I'm, I'm not operating under the, the power and the influence of the Holy Spirit. I'm operating under the power and the influence of the flesh of Mike Scott. And sometimes we do that. But I take great comfort in knowing that even though he's not finished with me, he's still working on me. He hadn't quit. 
He's still working. What is his main goal for you? What is it? What's God's main goal for your life? You'd be surprised if you ask somebody that out on the street. You know what they say? It's to go to heaven. No, it's not. No, no, it isn't. That's the ultimate. That's the consummation of it, maybe. But, but what's his goal in this life? It is to conform you to the image of his son so that when he clicks on you, you look like Jesus. So how much are you like Jesus today? How, how, the personality of Jesus in you and working through you, you ask the people who you live with in the family, what would they say? I, I know what mine would say. That boy got a long way to go. <laughs> he, he's not even in the same area code. But what would your family say? What, what, would, what about the people that you work with every day? How much like Jesus are you around the people that you work with, around the people that you go to school with? How, how much like Jesus are you to them? You see, what we do is we so often try to, we, we try to do what we do out of the flesh. What we need to do is to allow Holy Spirit to work in us and through us and to produce Spirit does. You can't work it up. In fact, in Galatians chapter 5, listen to what he says. He says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Holy Spirit worked that in you and through you. In the process. Where, where are we in God's process? Well, he calls us. Notice that he said in verse 30. He says, those he predestined, he also called. So what about God's call? If you're walking across the street and I say, hey, Matt. Matt's going to, most of you would turn around and look to see, well, who's that? Who, who's that knothead hollering at now? But if I called your name, you'd surely turn around as if to say, what? And you see, God is calling. Even now, this very moment, God is calling. He is calling all of you. He's calling me. He's calling us. What, 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 about, this, what about this God calling us? If somebody calls you on the phone, they intended to call you, didn't they? Well... Not always. But most of the time, somebody calls you, they intended to call you, right? And you answer. God is calling. God is calling with intention. Let me give you some aspects of how God may be calling you. He says, first of all, he says, he says come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Second thing he says, come to me. Hey, you. Come to me. That's what I call his, his call to salvation. Come to me. All you are weary and burdened. He says, I'll give you rest. I'll give you peace. He's got the call to salvation. If you're here today and you've never been born again, you've never been saved. Friend, God is calling you right now. God is calling you right now. Come to me. Come give your life to me. Come give your heart to me. Put your faith and trust in me. I will save you. I will take your burden. I will give you peace. Come to me. But maybe his call is, come, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Mark chapter 1, verse 17. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. This is what I call God's call to service. Maybe again but you've never really surrendered to serve the Lord there are a lot of people who just come and sit in churches on Sunday morning rarely do really anything connected with the work and the ministry of the church God's calling you to serve God's calling you in some way somehow to serve so that you become a part of the mission of the church which is to make men fishers of men then maybe another aspect of this 
Paul is a call to serve, to surrender in him, be in him. Jesus says, abide in me. Matthew, or John chapter 15, verse 4 says, abide in me and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit itself, neither can you bear fruit unless you abide in me. That's a, what I call the call to surrender. Call to put your life aside and allow Holy Spirit to work in you and to work through you. This is a call of surrender. Let Holy Spirit do what he wants to do in your life. And second of all, notice in this verse, he says that he He says, and those he called, he also what? Justified. I love that word. That's a good biblical word, isn't it? Justified. Jameson shared with you here a week or so ago that justified means just as if I'd never sinned. Well, here's another definition of justification. The word justification is a legal term that means to be declared right. Right. No longer wrong. Be declared right. To be declared innocent. How many of you are innocent? Am I the only one who's innocent? According to this, I'm justified. I'm innocent. When I stand before the Lord, He's not going to hold me I'm not going to be guilty of my sin. Jesus has taken that on himself. And he has given me justification. It means to be declared right, declared innocent, declared to be guiltless. He's cleared us of the charges. If you're born again, you of the charges. I love the way Billy Graham describes justification. He says it is the act of God whereby he declares an ungodly person to be perfect while he's still ungodly. That'd be me. That's what I'm talking about. Be me. Well, let's close with this. Jesus pleads us. Notice what he says. And those he justified, he glorified. See, glorified means that one of these days, our bodies are going to be like Jesus' body. Amen? Now, what does that look like? I, I don't know. I mean, there's a few things the Bible tells us. They tell us what it looks like, a glorified body. It tells us we're going to be recognized, recognizable. So if you, when you get to heaven, if you're born again, and you go to heaven when you get there, recognize uh, all of your loved ones absolutely sure are and they're going to recognize you and some of them are going to say well I never expected to see you here <laughs> and other of them are going to say uh, other of them other of them is going to say I, I knew you were coming I knew you'd be here someday right I don't know what it, what it all body I don't know what all that looks like Bible doesn't tell us evidently we'll be able to eat <laughs> hallelujah how about hey how about that brother Landon we'll be able to eat anything we want and we won't have to gain weight we won't have to worry about it, it it's not going to slow us down it's not going to make these bodies big and ugly and fat and sloppy we're going to be able to eat anything we want but here's the difference eating is just not going to be that important to us Speak right? for yourself. Huh? Speak for yourself. Oh, he's already taught. He's already, I know he's saying about the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Huh? Yeah, for seven years we're going to eat. <laughs> we're going to celebrate. You know, right now God is in the process of changing, changing our character, conforming us to look like Jesus. But one of these days... He's going to change these bodies. I don't know what it's going to look like, but I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It's going to look a whole lot better than it does now. Can't imagine that. (laughs) It's going to look better than it does now, amen? I I like what John says in 1 John. Oh, look at Philippians. Philippians. 
Philippians 3. Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. And then, 1 John 3, 2. Dear friends, we are God's children now. now. And what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be like him. But what does that look like? We don't know. But when he appears, we'll be like him because we will see him as he is. So the only thing we can do is read the scriptures about the promise that is there before us and just imagine. We can only imagine what that's going to be like. I don't know, but it's going to be good. Amen? Brother Jameson?